Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, a follow-up on John Deere's agreement with Farm Bureau to let producers fix their own tractors. Plus, egg prices. Everybody's talking about how expensive they've become. In Southern Gardening and Encore, Gary showcases campus plantings at Mississippi State. And in our feature, a look back at a tumultuous year, 2022 in review. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. So we know that John Deere and the American Farm Bureau came to a meeting of the minds on right to repair. Many farmers are celebrating that. Here's CNN's Ben Weinman with Why It Matters. It's hard to overstate how important this agreement is. John Deere's slogan is, nothing runs like a deer, and it's true. But the thing is only deer employees can repair and fix their equipment. No private repairs are allowed. Now, the agreement between Deer and farm industry representatives marks a major victory for farmers and ranchers. This has been an issue for years, including multiple lawsuits alleging that Deer was interfering with farmers' abilities to plant and harvest crops in a timely manner. Deer representatives came to an agreement with the American Farm Bureau Federation, which will allow farmers to buy documentation, data, and diagnostic tools used by the company's repair shops. And in talking with farmers, this issue has been going on for years, and they're relieved that change is coming. And some of these people have spent seven, eight hundred thousand dollars for that piece of equipment, and really they find out they're just kind of leasing it, renting it. It's not theirs because they don't have the right to repair. I can't work on it because I need to have the dealer come out with their laptop, their software, hook it up, and start troubleshooting that way. And now with this agreement, farmers like Walt won't have to contact John Deere. They can buy the equipment and figure it out themselves. And that could save them time in the long run, instead of their $100,000 equipment sitting idle. I'm Ben Weinman reporting. Something on everyone's mind, the price of eggs skyrocketing. And that's having an effect on more than just pocketbooks. Reporter Rhonda Fox has that story. I am often sold out. At $2.50, dairy farmer Angel Hebe's egg prices are hard to beat. I have like neighbors that call me and say, can you put a dozen away for me? Angel's egg prices are an anomaly. The USDA reports the price of eggs before retailer markup varies from $3.93 to $5.45, depending on what region of the U.S. you live in. Michelle Miller, a UW economic anthropologist, says the reason is threefold. Avian flu is hitting the poultry industry hard, but that's really only part of the story. Uh, we've got very high animal feed prices out there in, in part because of drought, but also because there are transportation issues. As far as like our mixes that we use, they all contain um, a dried egg in it. They've gone up drastically in the last few years. Eggs aren't the only ingredient putting a strain on businesses like Greenbush Bakery. Anything to Paper goods, flour, sugar is one that's been going up like crazy and our soybean fry shortening that we use that item used to cost us $45 for a 50 pound brick and it's up a little over $100 per brick now. Taylor says for now he's not ready to pass inflation on to his customers. I don't really like increasing our prices because you're really never going to probably bring those prices back down. Corn has doubled since I set my price at 250. Angel says the crippling price of chicken feed is forcing her to increase her egg prices. I am probably going to go to four dollars because that's a lot closer to covering my cost of production. So move over geese. Chickens are laying the golden eggs for now. Something else having an effect on egg prices, a chicken farm in San Joaquin County, California, facing thousands in damages from storms that pelted that area for weeks. Brittany Hope reports. 
My name is Karen Turner. I've been doing this for 27 years. When we're at full capacity, we have about 90,000 chickens at what any given time. But now... I mean, we've had losses. I mean, we're farmers. It's just the way it is. But uh, never seen anything like this. It's one after another. Every day, it seems like there's more and more repairs to do. The endless rain, wind, and thunder for nearly two weeks have left Karen and her chicken farm with devastating destruction and death. Actually, it started on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, complete flooding. This was under 12 to 18 to 24 inches of rain. We had two barns that were completely inundated with water that had 7,000, 8,000 birds in each barn. We were able to take the live ones that were left, move them, hand move them to another barn. But between those two barns, at least at least four or five, maybe 6,000 chickens. And then we had wind damage. Have you ever had losses like this before? <sighs> no, no. This was thanked uh, for the thunderstorms that we had the other night. Thanks to her friends stepping up. Right now, if I didn't have them, you know, neighbor helping neighbor, I, this wouldn't, this wouldn't be fixed. I need this one. You have your good years, you have your bad years, and. 2023 is definitely starting off with a bang, um, but after 27 years, you you learn you have to ride with that. On the lighter side, Gary Bachman, of course, has retired, but we start a two-part series on landscaping at Mississippi State University, where we tape this show. Here's an encore story on campus plantings from Gary. <music> The Mississippi State University campus has lots of interesting architecture and popular locations, like the drill field behind me. And the landscape is always going to include beautiful and colorful plantings. This planting in the center of the drill field is stunning. Purple fountain grass is a popular and drought tolerant grass that is perfect for plantings around campus. The clumps of purple foliage are topped with rosy red inflorescence. Complementing the fountain grass is the bright chartreuse yellow Alternanthera. This plant quickly forms a tight mass of color. Red Whopper Begonia and Magenta Annual Vinca are poking out of the other plants. I love the tall planters placed along the walkways between buildings. Evergreen yews with their broad needle-like foliage are used as the thriller plants. The filler plants are bright magenta flowered sun patients with vivid green foliage to show off the flower colors. Illusion Emerald Lace Sweet Potato is stunning with the bright yellow chartreuse foliage that spills over the sides of the containers. Accenting the sweet potato vine is the Mississippi Medallion winner Vista Bubblegum Supertunia. I like the use of masked knockout roses along the walk by the Student Union and the Chapel of Memories. These are an easy care choice in high student traffic areas. MSU has received the Green Star Award from the Professional Ground Management Society for the gorgeous landscaping that adds to the campus experience. I'm MSU Extension Horticulture Specialist Gary Bachman, and I hope you'll join us for the next Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature before we get too far into the new year, a look back at the old one. It was a busy year, Congress continuing the push to ring in meat packers. Bird flu emerged again in almost every state in the Union. Russia invaded Ukraine, fallout around the world. Floods and drought were everywhere. The Mississippi River dramatically low at one point. And a rail strike that would have crippled the nation came that close to happening. 2022 in review, that's coming up in Farm Week. Stay with us. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, 
self-determination and leadership, that these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home, that my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report rebounding from a downturn. Seems to be the case these days, Mike. First the markets drop, then they rise up again the next week. And we'll get into that. But first, the numbers looking up. What caused it? And then this month's WASDE report, we take a close look at what it said. And finally, our row report. What effect did the WASD have and how do things look going forward? So, the commodities we follow had a pretty good week price-wise, many possible reasons for that. Seems the WASD had an effect as usual, and we'll get into that soon, but for now, let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, cotton, only down about three and a quarter cents. Seems somewhere between 80 and 85 cents is where the markets have put it the past month. Last week's biggest gain, lumber at 66 and a half dollars. It's followed by soybeans at 36 cents. Seems soybean prices want to remain high. This month's WASDE report dropped last Thursday and said a few things the markets have already shown so far. The biggest takeaways are grain supplies, wheat up while corn and soybeans down. We've been talking about this a good bit already. Here's what it said. U.S. wheat supplies raised on higher beginning stocks. Feed and residual use raised 30 million bushels. Seed use raised 3 million. Season average farm price remains $9.10 per bushel. Global wheat supplies raised 1.3 million tons. Consumption raised 0.2 million tons. Trade raised 0.8 million tons due to increases in EU and Ukraine. Ending stocks raised 1.1 million tons. U.S. corn production down 200 million bushels as yield increase offset by less harvested area. Use down 85 million bushels. Exports down 150 million. Feed and residual use down 25 million bushels. Season average farm price remains $6.70 per bushel. Global corn production down with declines for Argentina and Brazil partially offset by an increase for China. Global corn stocks down 2 million tons. U.S. rice supplies reduced on lower production, down 3.9 million hundredweight. All rice average yield down, exports lowered 3 million hundredweight. All rice season average farm price raised $19.20 per hundredweight. Global rice supplies raised 0.5 million tons with higher beginning stocks for Brazil, Vietnam, and Pakistan, and higher production for India offset by lower production for China. Projected world ending stocks are raised 1.3 million tons. U.S. soybean production down 69 million bushels. Harvested area down 0.3 million acres. Yield down by 0.6 bushels per acre. Export reduced 55 million bushels. Season average farm price $14.20 per bushel. Global soybean production down 1.3 million tons on lower production for Argentina and Uruguay, despite higher production for China and Brazil. Global soybean ending stocks increased 0.8 million tons. U.S. red meat and poultry production down, egg production down slightly based on production and flock data. U.S. milk production lowered from last month with lower expected milk per cow. Fat basis imports for 2022 are unchanged. 2023 all milk price, $21.60 per hundred weight. U.S. cotton production, 438,000 bales up, with a record yield of 947 pounds per acre. Exports, 250,000 bales down, ending stocks up 700,000 bales. Season average farm price, 83 cents per pound. Global cotton ending stocks forecast 370,000 bales higher this month as lower production offset by lower consumption. Projected world trade is down 600,000 bales. 
So now that we have some context, what do the experts have to say? Market analysts Matt Bennett and Naomi Bloom both concede that the WASD had an effect, but to what extent? A lot of these prices have to do with seasonal shifts, as in prices have a tendency to rise and fall at certain times of the year. Maybe that explains what we're seeing. The thing about wheat, you come into the January report and you typically, it's not as big of a deal as corn and soybeans. You know, I mean, corn and beans is what we're really paying very close attention to. Of course, you want to look at what wheat acres look like. Well, with the kind of wheat prices we've had over the last year, it's not hard to believe that you would come in here with three and a half million plus wheat acres for total wheat over what you had uh, a year ago. And the thing is, I guess, whenever you look at that it's going to create quite a situation whenever we talk, start talking acreage moving forward, you know, for corn and beans. And so, you know, those, I wouldn't say they're etched in stone. Obviously, this wheat crop went into dormancy in not phenomenal shape. But the nice thing is we've seen a significant amount of moisture other than maybe Kansas down into uh, uh, Texas. We've seen quite a bit of moisture here over the last couple, three weeks, and we're healing up a little bit. I'm not so sure that this wheat crop might be fairly decent. I don't know that you'll see the abandonment we once thought we'd see. If the seasonals can continue to work as they've been working quite well, soy, soy acres, soy prices, and corn prices have a tendency to peak right at that February USDA report. Last year, they hit all of their upside technical objectives right into that report, and the only reason that we rallied after that was because of the war. So um, normally, you'll see firmer prices into February, and then that's it, because then we start talking USDA outlook for them. Yeah. Happy acres from here to the moon and record yield, and then prices have a tendency to pull back. So use the rallies and be more aggressive with the sales. I think the report's biggest news is that world stocks are growing at a time when the headlines have been all about an Argentine drought. Store and ignore, I just really still strongly feel is not the theme for this year and take advantage of the rallies and assume that the weather is going to improve. I mean, we're already seeing the weather patterns different. Um, the, the weather pattern for South America, they're thinking that it's going to be improving starting in February. The question is, is it going to be anything helpful to that Argentina crop or not? Um, and so I just, if it was mine, I would absolutely, any rally we see into the February winter rally, I would be making old crop sales and new crop sales without question. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Seems prices shifting with the seasons, as we've said. However, so far, it seems we may have a good year for row crops. Mike. Thank you, Zach. So before we get too far into 2023, a chance to look back at what turned out to be a tumultuous year. We get a lot of weather and ag policy stories every year, but in 2022, some themes emerged. Paul Yeager has more. The meat packer started the year in the driver's seat on packer margins. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Capitalism without competition isn't capitalism, it's exploitation. In early January, President Joe Biden announced the allocation of $1 billion to advance expansion of small to medium-sized meat packers and processors. The Senate Agriculture Committee held a hearing in April on a proposed bill that would require meat packers to buy half of their cattle on the cash market and create a library of contracts for all the nation's cattle sales. And I dare say that if we don't pass this bill where we have some transparency in this and we don't make an effort to reestablish the price, the, the uh, cash price, I'm not going to have any. When that happens, I'll go the way of most of the producers in this business. It's not a conclusion that there's anti-competitive conduct, and in fact, it's rather competitive within this industry. Likewise, there's not any research that shows that mandating cash trade is going to make, make for better cattle prices. That's, uh, that's just not part of uh, the research that I understand. That same week, the House zeroed in on smaller producers affected by the tandem choices of contracts known as Alternative Marketing Agreements, or AMAs, and the potential for more lucrative price discovery at auction. They're basically trying to cram our industry back into the bottle, the way it was 20 years ago, 15 years ago. That's not healthy for an industry. Change is a part of the industry, and especially if you look at the impact it's had on meeting consumer preferences, nothing could be more advantageous for the industry to listen to your consumer. By year's end, no legislation emerged from Congress for signature by the president. High pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI, emerged again in 2022, 
Bird flu would strike millions of birds in the U.S. and in nearly every state even after changes were made since the last big outbreak eight years ago. While fall has typically brought about a resurgence of migratory birds beginning their journeys to warmer climates, this summer also included what the World Organization for Animal Health called an unusual persistence of the virus in wild birds. Nearly every state has reported a positive flock where more than 50 million birds have died or been euthanized. In late February, Russia would invade Ukraine. The fallout locally in Europe strained supplies of energy and grain from the region and would reverberate across the globe as countries lined up in support of Ukraine. Commodity markets would respond to the flow of grain through the region. Late July brought major flooding in Kentucky. The eastern Appalachia region was damaged with 8 to 10 inches of rain. At least 37 people died in the early hours of the storm. More than 1,300 needed rescue, and thousands more were without power for days, ending the wettest July on record in Jackson, Kentucky. A drought record was reached in California. The past three years have been the driest on record in California, according to data dating back to 1896. Although the just completed 2022 water year was slightly wetter and cooler than the 2021 water year, it was still 24% below the historical average of precipitation. Dry conditions in the upper Mississippi led to problems downstream because of a lack of water. Dredging would be used to help get traffic moving. Uh, it's definitely created navigational hazards along the marine transportation system. Uh, but we've been working very closely with the Army Corps of Engineers who have put in a lot of work over the past decade uh, in preparing for a situation like this. The lower Mississippi River went through a limited barge draft restriction that is standard on the upper Mississippi. We're about 40 percent, in some cases half, 50 percent. You know, the industry is, is very resilient, working with the Corps to make sure that Let's say the core is dredging 12 hours and then we'll stop for 12 hours so that queue can, of, of barges and boats can get through. Um, at its worst, we had 2,200 barges directly impacted uh, with 150 boats waiting. The river level in Memphis near the minimum operational limit in October, but rose 16 feet the next six weeks. Some barge operators have reduced the number of tows by half. And those tows include a reduced number of barges due to width restrictions on the river. Barges are often loaded at only 75% of capacity. Recent rains in the lower watershed have raised river levels by up to 10 feet in sections of the channel. But the long-term prognosis is for lower than average levels to be norm until the drought is broken. Another of the infrastructure hiccups came from the railroad. Back in September, an initial agreement was reached between the 115,000 rail workers and their employers. This provided the biggest raises in 40 years, but it was more than money. Changes in policies that allow more flexibility and taking time off from work, including the right to take unpaid medical days off without being punished. There's a lot of areas of this country where your option for transportation is rail and it's rail. That's your only option. And maybe some areas of the country where you're close to the inland waterway system, you can move some freight at the margins to the river, but that's only, that's only limited. Economists had estimated a shutdown of the rail system in the U.S. would have cost the economy up to $2 billion per day. Over 40% of U.S. cargo shipments are moved via rail, and a strike could have caused cascading shutdowns throughout the economy. However, not all unions ratified the agreement, and Congress stepped in with last-minute legislation in December. No question it was an eventful year. Well, next week, an encore, an extended version of a story about a place called Bull Bottom Farms. It's a fun little story in Duck Hill, Mississippi, where it all started with farmland that belonged to the Robinson family since the early 40s. But all these years later, a new idea for how to work the farm and make it appealing to the public is growing in the hearts and minds of the Robinsons. Bull Bottom Farms and Agritourism, that's next time on Farm Week. 
Before we go, the egg shortage we talked about earlier is actually a blessing to some, including an urban egg farmer in Colorado. CNN's Danielle Cruder has more. These are my big girls. I love these ones. For Courtney Burse, having her own chickens in her backyard has been a lifelong dream. And like any good urban farmer, she takes great care of her ladies. Fresh spinach and different vegetables on a daily basis, zucchinis, pumpkins. She has them all set up. This is one of the main chicken coops. They love this one. They sleep in here. They roost in here. So they this is the fun area. Over the last year, Burst has brought in a few regular customers as she sells her free range organic eggs through online posts and word of mouth. But lately, something's changed. As store shelves have been empty, Burst's inbox has been filled with requests for eggs. It's been booming. <laughs> so I want to say like on a daily basis, I'm getting like one to two people reaching out like, hey, do you have some eggs av available? She's considering expanding her flock with new hens, but that's a challenge as more people are trying to solve the egg shortage in their own backyard too. It's been hard because a lot of people are trying to start their own flocks as well, which makes the prices go up as well. But for the beginner farmers who are able to track down some hens. I'm all for it, living off the land and natural resources. I love it. So I would say go for it. Mm, the golden egg lining. That's right. <laughs> Remember, if you missed the story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.